Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day.
are you, are you on drugs? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> this is how I live my life. And um, I just really, I was not ever comfortable with myself, ever. And as soon as I got high, it was just like this immense comfortability came over me. Um, and I was just talking with this newcomer about it last night and how I found that now in the AA. But, uh, so just like fast forward, uh, I went in and out and in and out of jail. Um, I was racking up felonies very quickly. And um, my last stint in jail was only it was like nine months. And at that point, I was like strung out on uh, meth. I had been like robbing people uh, at gunpoint and like strong arm robbery and like really nasty, dirty shit. And, um, oh, yeah, well, I skipped. So I went to jail for that kind of thing. Got a ton of felonies and strikes. And then I got out of jail, and I had all these felonies and strikes, um, but I still had this, like, big meth habit that I was trying to support. But I couldn't really do crime anymore because I was really afraid of going to prison. So I thought it would be a really good idea to start stripping. And um, I was just doing a lot of drugs and stripping, and stripping turned into um, pornography, and pornography very quickly just turned into like prostitution. And um, fuck, I would love to stand in front of this giant meeting and like just be like, yeah, I had a drug problem and now I work the steps and it's fucking great, you know? And not to talk about that kind of thing, but like that's where I go when I get high. Like that's what I do. And like in sobriety, my sexual preference is straight. I was raised in a gay household, it doesn't like make me feel weird, but like when I'm strung out on dope, like I prostitute with men because it's the only people that will pay for sex. <laughs> Detoxing all of these like fucking collage of drugs that I take every day, uh, all of these memories were like washing over me of just like fucking despicable shit with really <laughs> bad people, you know. And um, that's like when I first understood. Like I had read in the book Incomprehensible Demoralization, but I really didn't understand. It was just like words. It just I just read them off the page and, that, and then I left them in there, you know. So I was sobering up in jail that time, remembering like all of those kinds of experiences. Um, yeah, that and I just had no more morals, you know. I was just like fucking broken. But like that was not even close to enough to keep me sober because I got out of there, did this nice program, I got a nice street fight, I got a nice day a girlfriend, and like a week later, still had a pipe in my mouth, and I just like could not fucking get it. So finally, my brother's girlfriend, it's like five feet tall, um, whose story is just like fucking terrible, like makes my story seem like kittens and lollipops and shit. Uh, I don't know what time, sorry. How many minutes? Uh, you got like one? Yeah, one or two. Okay, all right, let's speed it up. <laughs> So she was like, oh, I heard you started using again, and I had been smoking meth for like seven days, and uh, I just I just started like, no, I'm really happy that you and Aaron have this like nice AA life, and you like go to meetings, and you go to work, and you go to bed, it's really nice, and you like it, and I'm sorry, like I've tried it, I've tried it for years, like I've literally gone for nine years at that point, and it just doesn't work for me, so please leave me alone. And this little girl starts laughing at me, just like laughing at me. I'm like, what the fuck are you laughing at? You know, this is serious. And, and she, yeah, she got really serious. She's like, you know, you are not your motorcycles. Like, you are not the people you sleep with. Like, you don't know who the fuck you are. Like, you have never worked the steps. You have never done service. You've never done anything in AA. You don't have the right to look me in the eye and say that you've done it and it doesn't work for you. Don't ever fucking say that to me. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I was so angry and so resentful that I decided I'm going to get sober right now. <laughs> and, and I'm 
I'm going to work all the steps as fast as I can and go out and relapse so I can say, fuck you, I did it. <laughs> and that was three and a half years ago. <laughs> uh, what I do today is I have like four sponsees. Um, like very actively. I still meet with my sponsor regularly. Um, I surround myself with people in the program. Uh, and I just like uh, make amends when I fuck up, you know? I like try to continue to do this thing. Uh, I really went hard in the paint in the beginning because uh, I was really trying to get back to using, you know? But I got my first round of steps really quickly. Um, but then I went through again in the 12 and 12 and just fucking blew my mind. Like the 12 and 12 took me from like physical sobriety to the beginning of emotional sobriety. Just totally fucking changed my life. And um, I wish I had more time to tell you some awesome sobriety stories. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I was like, I wish you were splitting this time. He's basically, you know, we're both main speakers. Even though I did like calling him the little speaker, but uh, <laughs> yeah, his uh, his now stepsister and or what, sister-in-law and his brother were like two of the first people I met when I came out to San Francisco AA. And uh, yeah, they were like instrumental in my sobriety when I moved out here, and they're fucking solid. Um, so I guess I'll give you guys the basics. My sobriety date is July twenty first, two thousand six. Um, I'm currently on step three. I've worked the steps a couple of times. I have a bunch of sponsees. I do h and I. I have commitments. My home group is the 10-step meeting at 6. It meets tonight. Um, it's right near the Oakland Whole Foods across from Children's Fairyland. And it's a really good meeting. Um, I'm originally from New York City. I was born and raised in Manhattan. Um, alcoholism is rampant in my family. Um, my mother's parents both died from alcoholism, liver cancer, and then <laughs> Nana, I think, just drank herself to death basically stopped eating and just you know my mom still drinks my dad's dry which is really fun um and then my dad's side of the family it's all you know like prescription drugs and you know it's a little bit i don't know more like under the rug whereas you know like working irish class working class like irish my mom's side like you know it's pretty fucking obvious but um yeah so I get to speak for a long time. Um, so growing up, you know, my parents got divorced when I was really young. You know, my dad blamed on my mom's alcoholism. Like, I knew that there was, like, that shift that my mother had when she drank. And I didn't want to be like her. And I blamed a lot of stuff that was fucked up in my life on her drinking. You know? And um, as soon as I got the fucking chance to drink, like, to really drink the way I need to drink as an alcoholic... I drank the same brand, and I drank the same fucking way, you know? And, like, as an alcoholic, it's like I had that physical allergy and that mental obsession, and, like, man, you know, like, I, like, would do stuff, like, when I was a kid, like, you know, before I really, like, discovered booze, like, there were boys, you know? And, um, at this point, like, I had already gotten, yeah, what happened? Yeah, I mean, I always, like, you know, I got kicked out of preschool, you know? It's like I've been to a ton of schools, I've been, like, you know, detention, like, you know, whatever. Like, I mean, I was always getting in trouble. And um, at this point, like, I was at all-girls school. I was, like, what, like, seventh grade or something? I was friends with this girl whose dad, like, co-owned Fury, you know, and she had a lot of money, and she didn't have a lot of supervision. And um, I always found girls like that because, like, I could, like, use them to, like, get what I needed, you know, whether it was, like, a house to throw parties at or, like, later on to, like, use them and basically, like, rip them off, you know, because I would be the one who'd be, like, hopping on a street corner and they would be the one who would be giving me the money. You know what I'm saying? So, anyway, you know, like, this chick and I would have, like, all these, like, crazy parties and stuff. And we were in seventh grade. And, like, you know, people would, like, you know, drink beer and stuff. But, like, I didn't really get it. You know, like, I'd, I'd like, drink a 40 or whatever. But, like, the allergy didn't really kick in, you know? Like, I was too distracted with, like, other stuff. And um, at this point, like, you know, when, when I'm, like, 12 or whatever, you know, I work my ass off. I get into a boarding school in England. Because my parents were divorced and my dad's a rageaholic. And it's unsafe to be with him. And I'm living with a mom and in a one-bedroom apartment. And it's like estrogen fucking hell. It's like World War III. You know, it's like, I'm getting all my hormones. She's going through menopause. You know, like, the whole apartment is just, like, you know, floral. We had a female cat. Like, it was just, like, insane. You know? And it was just, like, it was, like, pretty intolerable. You know, like, she'd have to go through my bedroom to get to the bathroom. You know? It was just, it was rough. And, um... 
Yeah. So, you know, I got into school in England, you know, I go over to England. I'm like, things are going to be really different. You know, this is my first geographic. Things are going to be different now, you know? And like, as soon as I got over there, you know, I started hanging out with the kids who like, you know, just, I mean, you know, we were like huffing blue and shit, you know? And, um, we like, we were hanging out at somebody's house in like rural England and, uh, we wound up like stealing this bottle of vodka and it was the exact same brand that my mom drank. You know, like the stuff that like I poured down a drain, like the drain as a kid, you know? And uh, we were on this like dirt road in like rural England and we start drinking. And that's when like, that's like, that was like my sort of like alcoholic moment is that like, you know, I'd had like wine with my family and stuff, you know, at like weddings or whatever. And, you know, I drink it really fast, and then, like, they give me another one, I drink it again, and they'd be like, this isn't so cute, you know? Like, she has this thing that's ruining our family. You know, like, people could see it, you know? So I couldn't drink the way I needed to drink. And when I drank that night, I guess I was like, yeah, when I drank that night, it was like, you know, I could drink the way I needed to drink. And I just kept drinking. And I always knew where, like, that bottle was, you know? And I don't even remember, like, you know, a lot of people talk about, like, getting relief, you know, and, like, there's, like, that line in the big book where it's, like, that sense of ease and comfort. Like, I don't even really remember, like, getting that, like, sense of ease and comfort really until, like, I had, like, done some serious fucking work in AA. Like, I didn't, I don't know, man. I mean, like, I did it for a fucking reason, but, like, man, it was more of, like, that physical allergy. And, like, if you guys don't know what an allergy means, and, like, this has been really helpful for me and my, like, when, like, somebody told this to me, it's like, you have an abnormal reaction to something that other people can have with impunity. So, like, if you're allergic to, like, peanuts and you eat peanuts and your throat closes up, like, that's abnormal, you know? If you, like, drink booze and, like, you physically, like, you know, some, you get, like, electrified or whatever, and, like, you want more and, like, there is, like, no way to, like, stop drinking, like, that is not normal. Like, I have an abnormal re reaction, like, when I put booze in my body. And that's what happened that night. And that was, like, the first night, like, where it was just, like, okay, like, this is why I'm alive. Like, this is what I'm living for, you know? Didn't really have a direction. Like, I found music. You know, I found boys as a sort of type of distraction. You know, I never really got into sports. You know, it was just, like, a lot of, like, you know, art, music, being isolated. Like, very isolated childhood. Like, really fucking isolated. Like, very uncomfortable. And, you know, when I found booze, it was just, like, that's, like, what I lived for. So I remember I, like, woke up the next morning. I think I lost my virginity. Like, you know, we were, like, in, we were in, like, rural England, so there was all these, like, you know, there might be gypsies out here, you know? And it was just, like, it was just, like, fucking, you know, like, there'd be, like, a car that would go by, like, maybe, like, I don't know, like, you know, maybe one or two went by, and they would, like, throw me in the bushes and stuff. You know, I drank, it was this, like, huge handlebar, like, handle, you know, it's, like, one of those big ones, you know? And I drank, like, probably, like, three fists of it. I drank most of it. And... Yeah, man. I mean, I blacked out, I puked, like, you know, everything. I woke up the next morning in bed next to, like, um, the guy who fucks me, his mother. And I think she was a nurse or something. Probably had alcohol poisoning. But I woke up the next morning, and I was still drunk from the night before. And, like, you know, I just knew, man. You know, like, that was, like, my moment. And I had immediate consequences for that. You know, I got kicked out of, like, got kicked out of two more schools over there. I wound up back in New York City. And then, you know, I got caught selling drugs and, like, you know, because I'd been in drugs for free, so I'd, like, turn around and sell them, and, like, whatever, and, like, you know, I'm 14, I'm in, like, you know, outpatient rehab, and, like, having to go to AA and stuff, and, um, yeah, so, like, you know, I'm getting urine tested and stuff, like, when I'm a kid, and, like, I'm being forced to go to these AA meetings, and, um, you know, we go to young people's AA in New York, and we just, like, kind of, like, make out with each other and, like, not work the steps, and, like, I don't even really know, you know, <laughs> like, I, like, nobody really was, like, you know, you get a sponsor, and you, like, work the steps, and, like, this is what you do, you know, I was kind of just, like, hanging out, you know, like, Adam touched on that, like, a little bit of the story, you know, it's, like, yeah, man, you know, I found the guy with, like, the mohawk and stuff. Like, you know, we hung out and, like, whatever. Um, so, so yeah, so I'm getting urine tested and stuff. So, like, you know, as a lot of my friends are out there, like, you know, really, like, getting deep in, like, their drug use and stuff, like, I was getting urine tested. And, um, you know, but I was, like, watching everybody, you know? And, like, I actually, like, wound up having kind of, like, a sweet life. When I was, like, 15, I think I got, like the math award and the science award and I had like a really nice boyfriend and you know like things were kind of starting to shape up you know I had like really good grades you know like this whatever and um and then I got out of that program and I wasn't getting urine tested anymore and I cheated on that boyfriend I broke his heart and um you know I started hanging out in the Lower East Side I started going to punk shows and uh you know we just like ran around and did what we did and 
God, man. I mean, like, we got away with so much stuff. You know, we just, like, I, I mean, we all know, you know, it's like, the fact that, like, most of us are alive is, like, a really big fucking deal. And, like, you know, because I used to do stuff, like, sneak out of my house when I was, like, 13, 14. Like, my friend Lizzie and I would go downtown, and we'd, like, go and find, like, drunk frat boy types, you know? And we'd, like, get them back to wherever they were staying, and we'd, like, distract them. And, like, I would, like, you know, distract them or something, and she'd steal their money, you know? I mean, this is the type of stuff that I was doing with, as a kid, you know? And, like... Yeah, I mean, my story, like, I haven't told, like, my story in a linear fashion like this. Like, it's really hard to think about my life before the age of 15. Like, I'm in therapy now. Like, I had to seek outside help after eight years of being sober. And, like, man, you know, like, I had blocked out, like, most of my life. So to go back and talk about a lot of this stuff, like, even just thinking about, like, being, like, a 13-year-old girl in the East Village or whatever and, like, ripping off these, like, gross guys or, like, you know, hanging out with truckers at, like, weird, you know, dive bars in Yorkville and stuff. I mean, it's just, like, you know, I was little. And it's, like, this, man, fuck. Anyway, so, yeah, so, you know, we start hanging out, like, downtown, you know, and, like, I really found my people. And, like, that was, like, the first time, like, a lot of people talk about coming to AA and really feeling like they found their home and really feeling like they're finally a part of and like they're safe or something. And that is what I found when I went to my first show. I went to my first show at ABC New Rio and there was that sound like that, like, you know, like when people like feedback on their instruments, you know, like that sort of like ear splitting sound and like, it just like, I just like felt like right at home and like everybody was really nice to me and you know, it was just, yeah, that was it. And, um, you know, I found my friends and stuff and there were still squats. Um, Giuliani had, like, decimated a lot of stuff, but, like, you know, there was still, like, you know, culture and, like, some sort of freedom, and, um, it was a pretty magical time, and I started doing a lot of drugs, you know, and, um, but, I mean, you know, getting booze and stuff is, like, real fucking easy, I mean, like, you just find some homeless guy, and you, like, give him money, and he goes and buys it for you, but basically, like, if you could reach the counter, you could buy booze, you know, um, so yeah, I spent a lot of time at CBGB's and spent a lot of time in the bathroom doing drugs. Like, I mean, I can get like real romantic about like how cool it was when I was a teenager in New York City, you know? And like, I sort of feel like I had, I did have a lot of fun, but like romanticizing it isn't really what I'm doing here today, you know? And um, I feel like a lot of people, especially when they get to tell their stories for a long time, like to really romance it. And it's like, that is not, you know, for me... Like, thinking about how paranoid I was, thinking about how long it took me to get out of the house, you know? Thinking about, like, ripping people off and, like, always knowing that, like, somebody might find me out. Um, you know, having to, like, hide stuff all the time. I mean, it took, I spent a lot of effort into, like, trying to hide my, you know, like, what I was doing. So, like, I realized at a very young age that if I got caught, I wouldn't be able to drink the way I needed to drink. So I was very good at, like, covering my footsteps, you know. So um, fast forward, I, like, wind up having stuff happen. Like, I wound up in the hospital one time. I was, like, shitting and vomiting blood. You know, like, my body, like, ha you know, like, we've all had those times where, like, our body just, like, gives out, you know. And, like, I wound up in the hospital, and I remember I got out, and I was at some, like, party or something in, like, you know, like, Alphabet City, and, like, my friend, like, walked in on me, and I was, like, cutting up lines, and she's like, what are you doing? You just got out of the hospital. And I was like, I had food poisoning. <laughs> you know? It took me four years of being sober to realize that that wasn't food poisoning. <laughs> you know? I was, like, 110 pounds, like, getting scattered for modeling and stuff. You know? Like, I was, like, sick. And, like, I just, like, had no idea that, like, you know, yeah, that, like, I could actually have, like, a physical effect on my body. So, you know, fast Forward, like, I wound up getting into college and moved down to Asheville, North Carolina. And, um, you know, speaking of effects on your body, it was a waitress at Waffle House who told me that I could get wet brain. I'd been, like, drunk for, like, two weeks. And she's like, yeah, that causes brain damage. And I was like, what? You know, like, there are physical repercussions. Like, I just, like, had no idea that, like, you know, like, what I was doing could actually cause me to just, like, physically, like, decompose, you know, as, like, a young woman. Um, so I moved down south, and, like, I wound up hooking up, like, with this guy who... I knew, like, from squatting with, like, my ex-boyfriend in New York City, and, like, I met him in Asheville, and I was like, oh, you're here. And, like, when I moved down there, I was like, this is going to be different, you know? Like, I'm going to, like, hang out with people who are, like, are actually doing stuff, and, like, not just, like, you know, I don't know, like, we're all, like, ripping each other off, and, like, 
doing whatever we did. So I moved down there and it got like real gnarly really fast. And basically, like, you know, I could romance like, you know, New York City, I could romance like what we did, but like, you know, I moved down to Asheville, it was like hanging out in like drug dealers' houses with like cats with like no tails and like, you know, just like weird, like you know, just like a lot of like people crossing over certain lines for like drugs, you know, like my friends like sleeping with a drug dealer and you know, I started to cross over certain lines for drugs and um, it wasn't really working anymore. And that's, that's like kind of like the kicker here and that's why I'm here is because it didn't work anymore. And for some people like, you know, I have friends who are sober today and they talk about drinking and they're like, ah, oh, you know, and they're just like so into it, you know, and like they're here out of like fear. You know, and it's like, I'm like really grateful that like my story is that like I drank and stuff would happen. Like I couldn't get drunk anymore, you know, or like I would have like two beers and get shit faced. Like my body was giving out. Like I couldn't get that high anymore. You know, a lot of my friends were like winding up um, in jail, killing themselves, overdosing, you know, it just like wasn't really that pretty. And I thought about killing myself all the time. Um... So when I would do stuff, like shit would like really hit the fan and I would go to a meeting and I'd come late and I wouldn't talk to anyone and I'd leave early and I wouldn't understand like why it wouldn't work and I'd do stuff like be like, I'm not going to drink, you know, and then I'd drink because I was defenseless against that first drink. And um, when I wound up getting sober, it was um, summer 2006, you know, I had a job, you know, I was working that summer, I was back in New York City, I had a job, I'd show up on time but I'd still be drunk the night before. I was doing stuff like... You know, I couldn't manage any of my money, so I was going out, I was having these, like, really disgusting guys, like, buy me booze, and I was always trying to sort of walk that fine line between, like, me getting so drunk that they'd be able to take me home, and, like, you know, me getting, like, what I needed, and, um, it, you know, it started with booze for me, and it ended with booze, and there's, like, a lot of fucked up stuff that I did, like, and there's a lot of bad stuff that happened to me when I was out there. And I really, like, I can't stand up here and tell you guys all of those stories and stuff. Because, like, we've all been there. Like, I don't feel like my story is any different from anybody else's. It's any bad, like, worse, or any better, or whatever. You know, it's like, we know what it's like to be out there. We know what it's like to feel like that incomprehensible demoralization when we wake up the next morning after we cross that line, you know, to do what we needed to do, you know? So when I wound up getting sober, it wasn't the worst time of my drinking. It wasn't when I was winding up in the hospital. It wasn't when I was shooting drugs. It wasn't when I was staying drunk for two weeks straight or whatever. You know, it was like everything was kind of okay, but like I was very isolated. Like no one wanted to hang out with me. Like I was a fucking loser. Like I was like that kid who was like hanging out with, I mean, I got sober when I was 20, but like you know, I was hanging out with, like, 17-year-olds who were, like, drinking in the cemetery or whatever, you know, it's like that, like, that's, like, not, you know, I was, like, that older kid who's, you know, it was gross, you know, and then I was hanging out with these, like, fucking losers and dive bars in Lower East Side, and, like, that was gross. So my last night using, like, wasn't really that different from any other night, like, my two friends had hopped trains up to New York from North Carolina, and we were hanging out, and, like, you know, of course, like, you know, having the door get banged on because we were, like, you know, doing whatever we're doing, like, in the bathroom, like, they're shooting up, like, out of, like, old e like, bottle caps. I, like, was really paranoid, like, I would never share needles with people, you know? Uh, I just remember that night, like, we, like, ripped off a friend of mine so, like, we could go and cop. And, like, you know, it all started, like, with us just drinking beer, you know? And then, of course, like, we had to go and get drugs. And, like, I was real fucking paranoid that night because of, like, the Rockefeller laws and stop and frisk in New York. And um, I gave my drugs to my friend Andy. And the next day, like, I was doing all this stuff at the time. Like, I was trying to drink more water. I was trying to exercise. Like, I was doing, like, other stuff that was, like, really fucking weird. Because, like, I was trying to sort of, like, get myself, like, my body was, like, starting to shut down again. Like, I always felt like I was going to faint. And, like, I, I didn't understand that drinking was a problem. So the next day, you know, and I started seeing a therapist who I met, like, when I was in outpatient rehab. So the next day I wound up going to an AA meeting. This is outpatient, this, like, therapist or whatever is like, you should try to go to a meeting. So there's that night with, like, my friends from North Carolina or whatever. I get rid of my drugs. The next day, I, like, wound up going to this meeting after I got off work. And um, I showed up late. I sat in the back. But the meeting, like, you had to go around and say who you were. You know, like, I'm Amelia. I'm an alcoholic. You know, your sober date. Like, your home group. What step you're on. Kind of like the spiel that I gave you guys. And um, after the meeting, like, all these women came over to me. And they were like... <sighs> 
you know, really nice, which is like really weird because like women are usually like, you know, especially when you're out there, it's like, you know, you're fighting for like, you know, your drug dealer's attention or like other guys or like whatever. Like I just like, I wasn't really like a human among humans, you know, I was always kind of like looking to fuck people over and like steal their money and their drugs. Um, so it's like really weird to be in a place where like women are being nice to me. This woman was like, you know, meet your sponsor. Like, you know, like this is Heather, she's your sponsor or whatever. I was like, okay. And like Heather was like, <laughs> call me every day and go to a meeting every day. And like, I fucking did it, you know? Um, and yeah, she was like real fucking good with me, you know? And like, I called her the next day. And, um, so this is like day two or whatever. And she's like, have you gone to a meeting? I was like, no, like I don't have anything in my house. Like, why would I go to an AA meeting when like, I'm just staying at home and there's no booze in my house. Like I'm not going to drink. And she's like, you need to go to a meeting, you know? And I like, it was like raining and it was dramatic. I like hopped in a cab and like went to the 79th street workshop and, um, you know, I'm sitting in this, like, basement, like, you know, 79th Street Workshop is pretty cool because it's, like, Park Avenue and Park Bench, you know, so you have all these, like, drunk Irish guys in the back, like, you know, sleeping it off, and then you have, like, Alec Baldwin or something, you know, it's just, like, weird, and, like, you know, I was in there, and, like, you know, I shared, and I was just, like, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do if I don't drink, like, you know, this is what I live for, like, this is, like, you know, like, that's, like, the reason why I woke up in the morning, like, that's, like, why I went to work, like, that's, like, you know, why I hung out with the friends who I hung out with or dated the people who I dated or like, you know, whatever. Like that was like my motivation for living is like for me to drink and, um, you know, for me to try and find that sense of ease and comfort. And I just didn't, you know, it's like, what do you do when you hang out with people? Like, even if we're drinking, we're doing something, you know, like that was like my personality. Like that was, you know, like I'm an alcoholic, like I drink, like I'm drunk. Like that's like what I do. And yeah, it was like really scary, you know, like talk about an existential crisis, like getting sober is like, you know, like, fuck, man. So, yeah, you know, I just, I cried. You know, more women gave me their numbers and, you know, whatever. And um, Heather would meet with me and, like, we'd read the big book and stuff together. And I always felt, like, really awkward. You know, like, when you, like, feel weird and you're, like, you know, like, maybe you have to, like, swallow your spit. But you can, like, really hear it. And it's just, like, you're just, like, so self-conscious. You know, I bet, like, probably half the room has felt like that tonight. You know, sitting next to you know, like, drinking your coffee and you're just, like, all weird. You know, I don't feel like that tomorrow like anymore thank god you know but like when I was newly sober it's like you know I was like with Heather and like it was just kind of I don't know it would be like reading Bill's story and it kind of reminded me of like a, an episode of like Law and Order because like it moves like pretty fast you know and like there's just all these different like whoa I don't know I, whatever I really like Bill's story and I'm actually gonna read part of it for you guys tonight but um yeah she you know she had me get a commitment and like maybe like 10 people had like a coffee commitment you know so I'd be like following people around as they like were buying milk and stuff and like I didn't really do the commitment, but it, like, got me to the meeting early. It got me to, like, try and talk to people, you know, and, like, learn how to be social and stuff. And, um, yeah, so I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to talk about what it's like being sober. It was really hard to follow Adam. I feel like I don't really like talking about what it was like to drink anymore. And I feel like I really was able to romance it and look like a badass and, like, you know, just whatever the fuck, like, tell a really good story. And tonight, like, I really want to talk about, like, how amazing it is to be sober and all the rad stuff I've done. And I have about, like, 12 minutes to do that. I'm keeping track. So, um, anyway, so this is from page 16 in the big book. This is the last part of Bill's story. Um, an alcoholic in his cups is an unlovely creature. Our struggles with them are variously strenuous, comic, and tragic. One poor chap committed suicide in my home. He could not or would not see our way of life. And I'm going to talk to you guys about, like, my way of life as a sober woman in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know? And, like, I don't think about killing myself today. There is, however, a vast amount of fun about it all. I suppose some would be shocked at her seeming worldliness and levity. But just underneath, there is deadly earnestness. Faith has to work 24 hours a day in and through us or we perish. And it's like, if I was in 12-step by a group of, like, pretty, like, hardcore motherfuckers, I don't think I'd still be sober. And I'm going to tell you guys about that. Most of us feel we need look no further for utopia. We have it with us right here and now. Each day, my friend's simple talk in our kitchen multiplies itself in a widening circle of peace on earth and goodwill toward men. So when Bill 12 Step Dr. Bob, you know, he took time out of his life to talk with this man. And not only was he able to convey, like, the basic principles of, like, what we're still doing here today, but he was able to stay sober himself. So, like, when Heather took time to sponsor me, and it turns out, like, I was her first sponsee. 
You know, I didn't know that. Like, I didn't know that, like, she didn't know what the fuck she was doing. But, like, she did. You know, but she was just doing what was done with her, you know? And she was, like, real adamant. Like, you know, you call me every day. You call me at this time. And she was, like, she was kind of, like, she was, like, a B-grade movie star. And she was, like, you know, filming in Vancouver and stuff. And, like, you know, we would have times for me to call her. You know, like, we talked every day. Like, she took time out of, like, her life to talk to me. And I wound up moving back down to North Carolina to finish up school. And people would be like, well, aren't you going to go to rehab? Like, aren't you going to, like, you know, take some time off and, like, get sober? And I was like, no. Like, I can't, A, like, afford rehab. And, B, like, you know, I didn't get sober to, like, not live my fucking life to, like, drop out of school. You know, like, fuck that. You know, it's like I've been able to maintain, like, a semblance of, like, kind of holding it together. You know? And, like, when I got sober, it's like... Man, oh man. So anyway, so I moved back down to North Carolina, and I wind up, I wind up going to a meeting at this meeting place in West Asheville, and a bunch of people wearing camo, non-ironically, you know, and they're fucking rednecks, and it's like, you know, I mean, you know, like, I'm like in the South, and, you know, there's some, like, dorky-looking, like, fat chick or whatever, and she, like, got my number, and I was just like, you know, so fucking judgmental, and Chanel, like, or I think that's, like, what her name was, she, like, called me or something, we, like, wound up going to a meeting together, and it's just, like, awkward, I was like, I don't want what these people have, I don't want to have anything to do with these people, like, fuck these people, I wound up going to, like, a young person's meeting, which, like, I still, like, and, like, you know, I went to this young person's meeting, and this woman was chairing, and she mentioned that she needed sponsees. So I was like, you know what, it's a sign to God, you know, and, like, this woman should be my sponsor. So I asked this woman to be my sponsor, and, like, you know, we're meeting at our house, and she's like, you know, you need to read the first 164 pages before I work with you and stuff. And, you know, I was telling her about my history, and she was like, you know, I don't... I don't think you're an alcoholic. I think you I think you did too many drugs. I don't think you're really an alcoholic. Because she was a real alcoholic. She only drank. And of course I wanted to hear that, you know? Like, oh, I'm not an alcoholic. Like, I don't have to go to AA. I'm just like, shit, you know, hang out with these fucking losers in church basements, go to young people's meetings when they play frisbee, you know? It's like, fuck this. So, you know, I was kind of fucked. And, um... So I wound up going to this meeting, and I was walking distance to my house. I didn't have a car, and um, I really don't like asking for help. So I walked to this meeting, and it was like a row of motorcycles outside, and I go in, and it's a bunch of, like, older people, you know? And, like, they had, like, that, like, they had, like, what I wanted. You know, you can, you can tell, like, me talking about, like, what it was like when I got sober versus, like, telling you the bullshit of, like, my life before I got sober. Like, there's, like, power and emotion in my voice now. I gave you guys, like, the stats or whatever, but this is what I really give a fuck about, you know? And if you take anything from what I'm saying tonight, like, take the fact that, like, you know, this program has given me life and that, like, I'm, like, fucking living life today. So I go into this meeting and, like, it's a bunch of people who are older. You know, there's kind of, like, that rednecky whatever, but, like, like good old boy. You know, it's just, like, it's good. I felt really safe there, you know? And people were, like, really nice and, like, man, I wanted what they had, you know? And, um... Yeah, I mean, you know, think about it. It's like I almost have a month now. You know, it's like I, I detoxed in church basements in New York or whatever. Wound up going back down south. Got this, like, weird fucking sponsor, you know, who, like, obviously wasn't carrying the message the way I needed to hear it. And I met this, like, big biker lady. And um, and I was like, you know, will you be my sponsor? And I, like, fired the other lady or whatever. And I worked with this woman. I don't even think she'd ever read the big book, honestly. You know, like, my, I got a real good foundation in AA, you know, that, like, got me to go to meetings and got me to get a commitment that, like, you know, I knew that I had to work the steps. I knew that I had to have a sponsor. And I worked the steps with this woman with whatever weird fucking worksheet she, she gave me. You know, she'd give me, like, stones and stuff for, like, good luck. You know, I mean, she's a cool fucking lady. You know, she's like a Harley mama. You know, like, when it was too cold to, like, ride her motorcycle, she had, like, one of those trucks with, like, the Harley sticker on the back and stuff. You know? I really loved Kristen a lot. And, like, she loved me until I could love myself. And, like, she was great. Um, we, when I, after I read my fist stab, she's like, come here, honey, we're just a bunch of cokehead whores, you know? <laughs> And then we burned my fourth step on a barbecue grill, which wasn't really that helpful for, like, you know, my eighth step list. But, uh, so I kind of realized, like, pretty quickly, you know, that, like, I really needed a sponsor. God, I wish I just talked about my sobriety the whole time with you guys. So I kind of realized that, you know, like, I needed a sponsor who, um, who would take me through the steps out of the book. And I got, I got this other lady to work with me, and, um, 
you know, she like she was like a book thumper, and she was part of like the book thumpers who like. Oh god, it was called Big Book Step City and like starting like Cape Cod or something. It's kind of for like the people who are in AA but like still want to kill themselves, you know? So they do like this like extra thorough four step where they spend like a year and they like write every morning and it's like you know, they're kinda of, like all like miserable fucks. And like but she knew the big book really well. So like I started working with this woman, you know? And it's like that's like how I started to get to know the big book or whatever. And like, you know, whatever, man. I mean, like, you know, fast forward, it's like, you know, I graduated from college, I got a job in New York with the same place I had an internship um, with, like, when I, like, got sober in New York, I wound up working there sober, like, the next summer, like, then they hired me straight out of school, and I moved back to New York, and, um, and I got this, like, amazing sponsor named Mary Ellen, it's like, thank God for her, you know, and she's just, like, real snarky, would call me on my shit, and, um, you know, knew the big book, and, like, no mess around, and, um, you know, I got a home group, so I do, like, every time I move, I move a lot in sobriety, I got a home group, I got a commitment, like, you know, I talk to newcomers, like, you know, like, that's, like, I think, like, where the fucking money is at, and, like, why I've stayed sober this time, is because even when, like, I got sober in New York and stuff, you know, like, when I had three days, I'd be talking to somebody who had one day, you know, and being, like, this is how I stayed sober for two days, you know, and, like, being like the hand of AA and like, you know, if I didn't do service in that way, like, you know, you can sit in a chair for an hour every day, you know, you can call your sponsor, you can complain, you know, you can like, whatever the fuck, you can make coffee, but like, if you're not like, you know, finding a God of your understanding and being the hand of AA, like, sorry, you know, like, good luck. Um, <laughs> you know, and like, I've been around for eight years and I've seen a lot of people just... You know, like, oh, you're having a hard time with your breakup? Why don't you talk to a newcomer? You know? People don't, like, want to hear that shit, you know? I think there are probably a lot of people in this room who don't like me. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, so, you know, I moved back to New York, and I start volunteering at ABC No Rio, the same place I went to my first punk show. And, um, and I wind up, you know, I'm doing what I do in AA. I'm showing up early, I'm stamping hands, you know, but like, you know, here I'll be showing up early, making coffee. I kind of learned how to like be like a human being in here and how to be social. I started booking shows. So here I am, I'm in New York City, you know, I have a good job, you know, I'm dating the distributor for Troma, you know, which is like really fucking cool, you know, like I'm going to shows, I feel comfortable in my own skin, I'm booking shows, I'm hanging out with bands, I'm being of service, you know, I'm doing stuff like making sure that we like feed bands, you know, which like people can be really bad about, you know, when you're on tour, like, oh yeah. Maybe you want to, like, beat these bands, you know? Like, kind of, whatever. Anyway. So, you know, fast forward, like, you know, I wind up being in a band. You know, I'm booking most of the shows that are happening in my community in New York City. Like, shit's, like, really popping off. Like, I have friends, like, all over the world, you know? I'm doing all this rad-ass shit where it's, like, you know, I was that chick who was, like, so-and-so's girlfriend or whatever, you know? Or, like, passed out or, you know, just, like, whatever. Like, I would, like, look forward to going to shows. And then, you know, I, I'd blow it, you know, like I'd overshoot it. And, um, yeah, so here I am, you know, what, I'm like three, four years sober or something? Like, in, you know, God, it was only like two years sober, like 2008, you know? And I'm like doing all the stuff that like I always really wanted to do when I was like out there getting wasted. Like doing stuff that like, you know, like I've done like a lot of cool stuff sober. And, um, yeah. So, like, you know, I want to do stuff like going on tour or, like, going on tour with other bands or, like, traveling and, like, going to fests and, like, not getting wasted. And, you know, I hate it when people are, like, you go to a barbershop and now you're going to get a haircut. It's, like, you can work a fucking program and do whatever you want, you know? Page 101. I mean, like, we can go wherever, like, as long as you're being of service and our motives are good, like, if you're spiritually fucking fit, you can do whatever the fuck you want. And that's basically still, like, that's, like, what I do today. I do whatever the fuck I want, you know? I get away with murder, you know? But, like, I am still sober. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, you know, do that cool stuff, whatever, whatever. Um, I wanted to move out to San Francisco. Um, I wanted to work at this magazine that, like, I really wanted to work for. They're like, we have a free place for you to live. You know, come move out here. I'm like, okay. So that's what I did. And, um, you know, like, my life got, like, real fucking, I mean, you know, I got a commitment. I made AA a priority. My life got real fucking weird and, like, really messy, you know. And um, it was really hard when I moved out here. I really thought I was going to drink. But I met this guy in a meeting in New York, and he hooked me up with this woman, Mary, and she became my sponsor out here. And, like, you know, Mary fucking saved my ass, you know? And, like, once again, like, I had that lifeline with AA. So, like, when I felt like I was drowning, I was thinking that I was, might possibly drink. At, like, four years sober, like, no, I had five years sober. Like, I was out here, like, doing the deal. And, um, you know, I've done stuff sober, like, 
you know, I really want to get a motorcycle. I want my motorcycle license. You know, I've done that. Um, you know, I went back to school. Now I'm a paralegal. You know, um, I bought a house in East Oakland. Um, you know, and I've done like a lot of stuff where it's like, yeah, man. I mean, like, fuck. You know, I've done that stuff where, like, you know, I've been hanging out at a bar with someone and pushed them in the bathroom and made out with them. You know, sober. It's like, you know, getting sober, it's like I've had, like, way more game. You know? Like, some really fucking cute guys. You know, my mom's always like, they just keep getting better and better, you know? I have a relationship with my family now. Like, you know, I was able to do stuff, like, even, like, at a year sober, my grandmother died. I was able to, like, show up for my family and, like, you know, be of service to my dad because I just lost my grandmother. But he just lost his mother. And, like, you know, my grandmother's the most stable person in my life. Like, my parents had left me. Like, I've had, like, not, like, I have severe abandonment issues. And, like, man, oh, man, you know? But, like, being of service has always, like, gotten me out of myself. So, like, where I'm at today, I'm going to wrap up. Um, God, I wish I had talked more about being sober. I'm sorry, guys. Um, where I'm at today, I'm going out after this, you know? Like, I'm going to a show. I have a lot of friends. They want to see me. They call me. They text me. When I call people, they actually answer the phone and call me back. Um, I don't think about killing myself anymore today. I very rarely think about drinking. If you still think about drinking, that's fine. Like, I'm an alcoholic, you know? Like, I am built to fucking drink, you know? So if I think about drinking sometimes, it doesn't necessarily mean there's something wrong with me, you know? But, like, you know, the fact is, is that, like, I'm not putting that shit in my body today, you know? Um, I actively work with women, you know, I have a lot of sponsees, and, like, that's, like, you know, fucking, like, my lifeline right there. And I still talk to newcomers, you know, and, like, I hear a lot of people who, like, have problems in AA meetings and stuff, and it's like, man, you know, I do stuff, like, I have newcomers come and meet me at meetings, you know, or, like, somebody just, like, lost their mom, or, like, whatever, you know, it's like, I make an effort so that, like, when I go to a meeting, I'm not going to a meeting for myself to go and sit in a chair for an hour, I'm going to a meeting because I have a service commitment there, because I'm meeting someone there, you know, and it makes being an AA a lot more tolerable, so, um, I don't know, man, I guess that's it, I'm out of time. Now I really want to keep talking. I, like, really didn't want to do this when I first started, but I don't know. I guess I'm finished. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.